new vaccines continue to emerge in the battle against COVID-19. The new vaccine made by Johnson & Johnson is the first to prove effective with just one dose. And controversies and disagreements surround vaccination programmes. The European Union launched a scheme that could block exports of coronavirus vaccines. In this climate, it can be hard to know what information to trust, but factual and reliable information is vital to creating trust in vaccines and to overcoming the pandemic. Ed Carr, The Economist Deputy Editor, and Natasha Loder, our Health Policy Editor, provide answers to some of the big questions about the global vaccination drive. Why are some people hesitant about taking COVID-19 vaccines? The vaccine hesitancy has got two components, at least, one of which are people who just don't, don't believe in vaccines full stop, and others who are saying, well, you know, I don't think this particular vaccine's been properly tested, I might just wait and see a little bit. But, you know, that second group is very fluid, and, and one of the reasons it's fluid is it depends upon the circumstances in the particular country. It so happens that in Britain, the National Health Service, particular hospitals, are overrun at the moment. Uh, and, and you really, really don't want to get COVID-19 just now, a serious case of it. So the impulse to get vaccinated is pretty high. But if, you, if you're in New Zealand, you know, which has, I don't think, any cases at the moment, certainly if they are, they're sporadic, um, you can probably afford to wait. What role does the media have in establishing trust in vaccines? I think we have a responsibility and I, I think the difficulty particularly is when you talk about adverse events and so you know in you know in any vaccine trial if you're jabbing I don't know 40,000 people you're going to have people have heart attacks and drop dead just by chance particularly if you're working on 60 and 70 year olds if you're giving them vaccines and you know it's very easy to sort of say oh my goodness somebody dropped dead on this trial right and uh, isn't this terrifying um, but you know that's for the regulatory authorities to investigate and determine if it's related to the vaccine it's not for the journalists and so while you have to kind of cover those stories sometimes you have to be kind of quite careful and say well yeah but remember that these things do happen by chance the mrna vaccines are new how do we know they're safe I think it's worth remembering that although this is a new platform uh, for a vaccine, that doesn't mean we haven't been testing these mRNA vaccines for quite a long time because they've been trying to use them to make cancer vaccines, which are actually pretty difficult to make and they haven't been that successful. But they've been trying for a long time with this platform. Um, and the reason is, is because it's quite easy to tinker with. And, you know, when you have cancers they change a lot and so the idea is is that maybe you could you know ma match the, the vaccines to the cancer so um i think you know we, the amount of data we have on the platform goes far beyond what we're seeing in the last year um so i mean i would be completely happy to take uh, any of these vaccines will the vaccines work if the virus mutates i think we're going to have to live with mutations um, it is impossible to say how a virus is going to mutate unless there's new science that comes comes out but at the moment when you know you get a mutation it's really hard to say what it's going to do and um, you know when I get an email from the news desk saying there's a new mutation what does it mean what should we say I say absolutely nothing basically because we don't know what it means but I, I do think that we will be adjusting our vaccines um, further down the line because because it's it's written in letters RNA like DNA um, it's easy to edit so that if you get a mutation of the of the virus it does it, you don't have to start from scratch you, you've got you've basically got the platform there and you can edit the you can edit your mRNA to reflect the mutation. Um, in, in the virus. So it's, a, it's not only clever, it's adaptable reasonably quickly. How are countries deciding how much time to leave between doses? With regards to changes to dosing, yeah, it's all about trust, isn't it? The question is, do we trust the government to be making the best decision? What they've done in Britain, they've made a public health decision that actually um, they just want to roll out the first dose to as many people as possible. Um, so that you raise the level of protection that 
twice the number of people have from zero to whatever it is they're getting. It may be 70, it may be 80 percent. You know, we don't really know what they're getting in that intervening period. So the question is, um, by reducing it to one dose in the UK, are you increasing the risk that the virus uh, mutates? And so there's a debate about this, isn't it? It's sort of like, well, and you've, you've got to kind of weigh up the fact that one person is getting most, but not all of their protection compared to sort of giving it to someone who had no vaccine whatsoever. Now, I don't think anyone really knows the answer. Certainly, uh, one virologist has said, I think this, this raises the risk that you will get mutants escaping. I'm, uh, I don't feel qualified to judge. And I, I, don't, I think the jury is out, actually, on that. I think it's very interesting to note how America, where cases are picking up very badly and death rates have begun to pick up again, having been you know, publicly very, very con- condemning of Britain, we'll see if American hospitals get overrun, whether there isn't more pragmatism like that. These decisions are difficult. There's, n- there's no perfect, perfect decision and, and you have to do the best you can. Should vaccines be mandatory for travel? mandatory vaccine and it's something we've we've spoken about um i personally think it's it's highly unlikely and counterproductive for governments to do anything like that is no no better way of undermining trust than saying you're not going to take this unless i force you to do it um so if there is anything mandatory about it it's much more likely to be a kind of corporate pressure or something like that you know we expect people to be vaccinated before they come to work or whatever it might whatever it might be um and that hasn't you know it's too early so far in vaccination programs to know whether that's going to happen. I mean, the classic um, bioethical view of vaccine passports is that it's not a good idea. Um, and economists tend to think that too. It tends to be counterproductive. It leads to cheating um, and discrimination. It's not terribly useful. Um, so, um, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. All sorts of things happen. I think the other thing that factors into this is quarantine. And so if you're going from a country uh, with a high incidence to a low incidence, those countries can and will ask you to quarantine for two weeks. And so I think as a way of bypassing quarantine, it's quite likely that they'll say, well, if you've got yourself a vaccine and you've been tested and a vaccine and a test for the COVID, you don't have to quarantine. So I think that is really likely. I'm Edward Carr, The Economist Deputy Editor. I hope you've enjoyed this film. If you want to read more of our COVID coverage, please click on the link opposite. And keep an eye out for The Jab, our new COVID podcast. And don't forget to subscribe.